Okay, hi there and welcome to a macroeconomics video. Some of the key benefits and potential drawbacks of a period of fast economic growth are explored in this short revision topic video. So first of all, what is economic growth? Well, typically it's measured by the annual percentage change of the real level of national output or GDP. That's GDP adjusted for inflation. But whilst that might be the short term rate of growth, most economists see growth as a long term, long run concept. Uh, they define growth often as a sustained increase in a nation's productive capacity. In other words, aggregate supply and also an improvement in its productive capabilities. China, of course, is often cited as a country that has achieved phenomenally fast growth over recent times. This is an interesting chart showing the pace of growth since 1980 and on occasions China has grown by more than 12% per year. Certainly the average growth for most of this period is well above 8%. But the growth at the moment is slowing down. It looks as if the Chinese growth rate seems to be slowing down at or around 6%. Will this process continue? Here's a really interesting chart showing the annual rate of global or world GDP growth, shown here in the black line. And by the way, this is adjusted for purchasing power parity. Different countries have a different share of GDP. And you can see that just in the last couple of years, the rate of growth of the world economy has slowed down from 4% to 3%. Uh, that is true in the both advanced countries and also emerging market economies. Notice also that the rate of growth of emerging market countries is always or typically faster than the world average. Advanced countries are struggling to grow at more than 2% a year. And here's the picture for the UK, uh, again showing the last recession in 2008 and 2009. The growth rate in the UK has actually been slowing down since 2014. So what are some of the main benefits or advantages of rapid economic growth? Let's pick out a few key points. I'm going to pick out six points for you. First of all, growth can lead to higher per capita incomes, particularly if the pace of increase of GDP is faster than the natural uh, growth of population. Higher per capita incomes, of course, help to bring down uh, extreme poverty levels. We'll look at some countries about that in a second. Growth can simulate increased consumption and savings per capita as incomes go up. Savings are important, particularly if they flow into financial markets, which in theory then allows more resources to lend for productive investments. One hopes that fast growth can also promote better human development outcomes. So we look to see the possible connections between growth and some of the key aspects of the Human Development Index. And a fast-growing economy, fast economy, in theory, again, should provide more jobs, higher employment, lower unemployment, increased participation in the formal labour market. Growth can feed on itself. There can be a positive feedback loop, so increased consumer demand and spending can often stimulate capital investment by businesses and government via a positive accelerator effect. And growth typically also helps governments in the sense that if it increased incomes and profits, they should generate higher tax revenues for the government. We call that a fiscal dividend, which again opens the possibility of increasing spending on key public services such as healthcare, education, transport and pensions. Three countries we'll focus on just as a little way of showing some of the dynamics of growth. China, we've already mentioned, Vietnam and Ethiopia. So Vietnam, a fast growing country in Southeast Asia, Ethiopia, one of the fastest growing countries in the world, not just the African continent. We can see here the progress in per capita incomes, GNI per capita, has risen from just under $10,000 per year. Uh, this is PPP adjusted and it's in real terms in 2010 to over 15,000 in 2017. Likewise, Vietnam has uh, increased significantly its uh, per capita incomes a near 50% increase there since 2010. And Ethiopia has also made significant progress in lifting per capita incomes in percentage terms, an even bigger change, uh, but of course still remains relatively low, even compared to Vietnam. So uh, a really interesting tweet from the great Chinese expert, Linda Yu. Before, nine, before 1750, per capita income in the world doubled every six 
thousand years since 1750, it's doubled every 50 years. So growth is a way of catalyzing, accelerating the pace of growth of per capita incomes. And one of the spillover benefits of that is that we can make progress in cutting extreme poverty. I'm taking here the measure of extreme poverty. There are now several published by the World Bank of three dollars, people living on less than three dollars twenty a day at real 2011 prices and again adjusted for purchasing power parity. So this is the mid range of the extreme poverty lines. And you can see that China again has made big progress in cutting extreme poverty by this measure. It's now less than 2% in China. Vietnam has made huge progress in cutting extreme poverty over the last 10 years or so. Ethiopia less so, of course, remember their per capita incomes, if we go back a slide, their per capita incomes were under $2,000 in 2018. So they've got a higher percentage of the population living on less than $3.20 a day, but they are starting to make progress on this measure. And they've made bigger progress if we use the $1.90 a day uh, benchmark. Another benefit of growth can be improved access to or ability to afford healthcare. And uh, here is some progress in terms of these three countries again improving their life expectancy at birth over the period 2000 through to 2016 17. Uh, the figures I'm using here are pretty much the latest data that is publicly available. It just takes some time for these figures to be updated. Well, those are some of the benefits of growth. Let's evaluate by thinking about some of the main risks, the drawbacks, the potential downsides of fast growth. Well, four uh, in particular. Um, one is that if you grow quickly, there is always the risk that you end up having higher rates of both demand pull and cost push inflation, particularly if you allow an economy to overheat, aggregate demand is shifting out and aggregate supply becomes inelastic. A country essentially runs out of spare productive capacity. On the trade side, if people are earning more and spending more, that could increase demand for imports, which in turn can increase a country's trade and current account deficit. And there's, of course, huge environmental concerns that as incomes and consumption goes up, we're using more of our scarce resources. There's more pollution, more congestion, more waste, and that can lead to increased social costs. Some governments indeed may prioritise economic growth over the impact on the environment, risking a long term decline in the stock of a country's natural capital. And there's a big debate about the extent to which growth has a negative, deleterious effect on income and wealth inequality. Does it necessarily lead to an increase in relative poverty, even if per capita incomes are rising? Well, there's a huge debate about this. One of the measures we can use is the Gini coefficient. Actually, in China, since 2008, the measured Gini coefficient, and there are big doubts about, about the accuracy of the data, the Gini coefficient has come down from 0.43 to under 0 0.4 in 2015. Likewise, in Vietnam, per capita incomes have risen. They remain very low. Uh, the Gini coefficient is marginally lower than it was uh, in 2004, as you can see here. It's gone down from 0.37 to 0.35. However, counterpoint in Ethiopia, um, it's gone up from 0.3 in 2004 to 0.35 in 2016. It's not automatic that fast growth leads to worsening, worsening inequality. Much depends on the individual context of the countries we're looking at. A couple of uh, evaluation points just by way of finishing this short video. I think the quality of growth and the composition, if you like, the makeup of growth does matter, not just the rate or the pace of growth. And there are three particular concepts that work but exceptionally well in terms of evaluation. One is balanced growth. For example, balanced growth between consumption and investment, between one region of a country and another, between one locality and another. So balanced growth is quite important. So too, surely, given concerns about the climate, is the concept of sustainable growth, uh, growth potential across generations, and, and in particular, the protection of natural capital. And also inclusive growth. Do the benefits we've talked about in this video, in terms of higher incomes, more jobs, higher savings and consumption, are those benefits widely disseminated, widely spread, 
Uh, do they reach, for example, the bottom 40% of the population? Or are many of the benefits of growth really uh, going to a fairly narrow, elite segment of society? Uh, the beneficiaries are mainly at the top end. That's a big question. Inclusivity of growth. Well, growth helps lift a country in terms of the size of its country. According to the IMF's latest data, um, if we adjust for purchasing power parity, then China is now the biggest economy in the world. And it's getting bigger and bigger, as you can see, growing by just over 6% uh, per year. India is now the third biggest economy in the world. And Indonesia and Brazil and Mexico are taking strides forward. So growth undoubtedly propels countries to increased prominence in the world economy. And that's, suppose, that's fundamentally also part of the geopolitics of the growth debate. There we go, a quick look at some of the benefits and costs of growth uh, using some updated figures, and I hope you found that useful for your macroeconomics.